and a warm welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, today we're very happy to have Dr. Tobias feldman Wüstefeld as a guest speaker. And uh, to those of you who don't know him already, I would like to briefly introduce him. So Tobias feldman Wüstefeld conducted his doctoral studies at LMU Munich and the Phillips University in Marburg under the supervision of Anna Schubo. And during his doctoral studies in 2011, he also spent three months in San Diego as a guest researcher in the Sports Center for Computational Neuroscience, working with Scott Making. And after receiving his PhD in 2014, he continued to work in Anna Schubo's lab in Marburg as a postdoctoral researcher. And then in 2015, he uh, joined the University of Chicago where he worked with Edward Ah and Edward Vogel. And since August, 2018, he has been appointed as lecturer at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. So today he's going to tell us more about how to use EEG to measure suppression and enhancement in visual attention, which is also a subject that a lot of us are very curious about. So um, we're excited to hear more about that. And with further ado, the stage is yours, Tobias. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you very much for having me here today in your virtual colloquium. Um, I will be talking today about how we can use EEG to measure two attentional factors, namely attentional enhancement and attentional suppression. So um, starting point of my research is the observation that in very many situations, there's much more information in coming um, to your retina than you can process and your brain can process at the same time. So for example, if you're a Times Square and you're looking for your friend, you might have trouble finding him because there's just too much simulation at the same time. You need to focus on certain aspects, for example, search certain areas of your visual, um, of your visual field or certain features such as color. For example, if you know that your friend is wearing a blue shirt, then you might focus on blue stuff and then you might eventually find him down here. Um, so to, in order to find your friend, visual attention is a very useful mechanism, it comes in very handy here because it can serve as a filter. So the idea is that visual attention helps you to select relevant information so you can prioritize that information while irrelevant information is filtered out. It's kept from your system. And then once you've selected the information that is potentially relevant to you, you can keep that in working memory, even if there's no, even if this input was gone, you could still maintain that visual information in working memory. Now, the problem is that oftentimes we don't know where the relevant information is, of course. So how does the visual system um, manage our scarce resources so efficiently the, um, in order to ensure that we can actually find what we're looking for. If you're looking for Waldo or if you're looking for a specific Lego brick of a certain shape and color, this can be a very challenging task. And of course, we don't want to assume that there is some kind of homunculus that determines how um, how the visual priority of certain elements in the visual field are determined. So what we want to achieve is a comprehensive theory of visual attention that allows us to predict under which circumstances, which information is receiving priority in the visual system. And one of the um, obvious factors that comes into play here is the so-called bottom up um, visual attention. So this means that the resources are distributed as a function of salience. So for example, if you have a poppy flower in an otherwise green field, you will very easily find this because it's literally popping out. 
Similar example, if there's a person that is much taller than other people, it is obviously much easier to find that person. Another factor is top-down attention allocation. So here, this means that we are spending our attentional resources um, based on our goals and intentions. So um, for something that is currently relevant for, to us. For example, if you're looking for your keys on your desk, if your desktop looks anything scattered as mine, then you might have had these issues as well. So where are the keys? Yeah, they're actually here. But in order to find them, they're not very salient here. You need to have some kind of template looking for um, that allow you to look for something specific like a combination of features. Or sometimes search can be very difficult if you're looking for this frog. Imagine this is your pet frog and you need to feed them and um, pick them up. And they have quite a good camouflage here, as you can see. So uh, it's the opposite of popping out really here and you need to exactly know how your frog looks to find your frog in this um, environment. So top-down attention deployment is goal-directed deliberate attention of deployment. So for example, if Batman is looking for a black Lego brick that is missing from his car, then it might be looking, you might be looking for something like this. But then in certain situations, there might also be irrelevant information that is particularly salient. And that means that you might get distracted by the irrelevant information. So um, it is important to know that basically you have to balance these two factors because you want to avoid distraction by irrelevant stimuli. So if you were only using goal-directed attention, um, without goal-directed attention, you would never find your friend because he's never the most salient um, well, element in that field. But at the same time, without bottom-up attention, if you're only looking for what you expect, you might actually overlook something that is particularly relevant but unexpected. I don't know if you can read this little comic here. There's basically two uh, soldiers in typical soldier attire and a clown, and the clown is saying, you guys are stupid. See, they're going to be looking for army guys. So this illustrates that it's pretty clear that even if you're not looking for this clown, it might catch your, capture your attention. And this is something that is important, for example, in traffic. So even if you don't expect the red light, it's pretty salient and can capture your attention. It could be a colorful snake that is harmful that you need to see, or for example, the fuel indicator telling you that you need to get um, gas at the station. And this brings us to the concept of visual search. So basically what you're doing in these situations is you're looking for something that is potentially relevant and you need to find it among other items. So for example, where are my keys? Where's my friend? These are examples I've shown you. Another more um, everyday example nowadays um, is where is the app logo for a specific app on your phone or when I had to start this presentation, I had to find the PowerPoint logo on my desktop. And sometimes visual search can even be a matter of uh, life and death. For example, if you're scanning um, breasts for a tumor or if you're a security officer uh, looking on x-ray pictures for weapons. Now, at the lab, the visual search task has, of course, um, more um, geometric, simple, shapes that we can physically well control. Um, so instead of using Lego bricks, we often use these, although some researchers also like to use real world examples for specific questions. And here you can see a few examples from the past, well, four decades of research on visual search. You can see they all look very different, these, um, these elements. But they all have one thing in common, namely a predefined target that you need to find among so-called distractors. So elements that are potentially um, making it harder for you to find the target. A very prominent example of a visual search task that was used in the lab is the additional singleton paradigm that very well uh, illustrates how this, um, well, this um, battle between top-down and top-down top and bottom-up attention can um, can work. 
So in this task, participants had to find a diamond shaped target and report the orientation of the line within. And they observed a certain response time here. And now in some of the trials, there was an additional singleton, a color singleton, which means that one of the irrelevant items was um, unique in its color and thus making it very salient. And then what Tavis observed was that there were much longer response times. And this suggests that there, um, these salient irrelevant items can capture attention and thus distract us. So if we think about this as a priority map based on which we choose which items to attend more likely, um, then you could say that there, the target and the distractor both have a high uh, salience here or high priority here because one is task relevant and the other one is particularly salient. So there's at least these two factors, goals and intentions, but in a very influential review paper in 2012, um, Ed O and colleagues um, pointed out that there's actually many factors that cannot be subsumized under goals and attention or physical salience, for example, reward, learning experience or emotional content. So in order to perfectly depict and predict which items get more or less attention, it is important to also take these factors um, into account. And another thing that we need to take into account is suppression. So there's not only that items can have a different priority, we can also proactively suppress items below baseline. For example, if you know that there's something going to be presented here that is irrelevant, you can actually suppress that location or you can suppress certain features. For example, if you know that the distractor is going to be blue, then you might um, reduce the activity of all blue items on the screen. So it would be easier for you to not get distracted by them. To illustrate how this might work in a real world example, well, not quite so real, but um, in the Lego world anyways, if you're Batman and this might be potentially distracting you, one thing is of course to enhance the relevant item. So the, um, in this case, a black um, two by three item and ignore the rest, but to actually actively suppress that location might make the task even easier. So how do we measure suppression and enhancement? An important measure of attentional enhancement is the so-called N2PC component. So the N2PC is a negativity contralateral to the attended hemifield. So for example, if you have a target here in the left hemifield, you will see a larger negativity on the right in the right hemisphere compared to the left hemisphere. And if you depict the same data as a line plot, you will see this typical shape of the NTPC, which also tells you the time course, of course. So you can see here, usually between two and 300 milliseconds, there's this negativity going on. And this reflects the prioritization of a target in this in this example. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to to um, interrupt me any time, um, because it's uh, it's better to to ask questions right away when if, if there's any you know um, misconception or if anything is unclear, it's easier to um, to address that right away. Um, okay, so this is the N two PC. And the NTPC can also be elicited by distractors, not just targets. So in this case, we can see that the target is on the vertical midline. So as we're looking at the lateralized ERP, contra minus ipsi, anything on the vertical midline is so to say invisible to that signal. So by using this method that was introduced by Hickey and colleagues, um, we can actually isolate the processing of a single item, in this case, the salient distractor. And then what we observe is also a, um, an N2PC, a distractor N2PC, which is um, contralateral to the distractor. This um, is also sometimes called NT component. And the distractor N2PC is um, related to the attentional capture. So that means in this case, at this moment in time, the distractor captured the participant's attention. And then what you can typically see later um, 
starting at around um, 280 milliseconds typically is a PD component. PD stands for positivity contralateral to the distractor. And as you can see here, this positivity is larger in the right hemisphere if there's a distractor presented in the left hemisphere. So this um, PD component is related to this active suppression that I was talking about. So in sum, we have these um, two components, the um, N2PC and the PD. The N2PC can be elicited by targets or by distractors. And um, by means of using these uh, components, we can basically track the attention deployment in the visual field. So for example, if you have condition A and you observe, this is like just a, just a bar plot to illustrate a, a possible pattern here. So on the y-axis, this would be amplitude of the mean ERP. And here you can see the um, N2PC measures enhancement, the PD measures suppression, and the N2PC and PD can both be used for measuring distractor processing. The N2PC can um, be used to, uh, can be used to measure target processing as well. And then we could, for example, compare it to condition B and see, okay, which of these three aspects of attention deployment is different to um, better explain the behavior. So um, I wanna illustrate how this works in a few example studies. Um, so in this first study, I'm gonna show you how um, the physical salience or the um, the noise um, in which a stimulus is presented affects attentional factors. So here you can see in both cases, the target is this red Lego brick, but um, you might have an intuition that it is much easier to find it here compared to here. And the only difference here is really the noise or how the background is, um, how the background looks. Low noise or high noise. So um, in the lab, we used, uh, again, simple uh, shapes for better physical control. And in the low noise, all the distractors have the same orientation. In the high noise, noise condition, um, all the distractors had like very heterogeneous random, um, random orientations. The target was the oblique line, diagonal line here. And there was always one salient distractor, which is just called distractor here. That's the red line could appear in low noise or high noise. And the measures we used was the target N2PC. So as a measure of enhancement, the distractor N2PC is a measure of attentional capture. So how much attention does the distractor uh, capture here versus here? And then we also used the PD component so is it easier to suppress something irrelevant here compared to here, for example? So we needed um, target lateral trials and distractor lateral trials to measure the N2PC and the, and the PD. Again, uh, one of them has to be on the vertical midline so that we can isolate the processing of the other item. And the trial procedure was really very simple. It was just a fixation dot, a display was shown, and then um, there was no display anymore until participants responded with a button press on the keyboard. The results show that indeed with low noise, performance is better, shorter response times, higher accuracy. Um, and of course, the question is now, why? Why do we see this pattern? And this is really where um, the EEG comes in handy because it allows us to measure these three different processes that might all, or um, well, one of them might be affected or several of them might be affected and thus explain the behavior results. So here are the EEG results. So these are um, the low noise trials. So with the homogeneous background and you can see that there is an N2PC here and um, not so much here. This is the same data below, the difference waves. Um, it's the same data as above, but as a uh, difference between contra and ipsi, which makes it easier to visualize these components. So you can see an N to PC elicited here. And 
here, and you can see a PD elicited here. So this is in the distractor lateral trials. So you can see that the target is enhanced and the distractor suppressed in the low noise condition. Now let's compare that with the high noise condition. Here you can see there's also an N2PC. There's also a PD. But in addition to that, we also see prior to the PD component a distractor N2PC. If we compare them directly, you can see that in, uh, in the homogeneous context, the low noise condition, the N2PC is larger and earlier, whereas in the heter compared to the heterogeneous or to the high noise condition. And in the uh, distractor lateral trials, we can also compare the PD component. And you can see um, that the PD in heterogeneous trials in high noise trials is later than in the, uh, the low noise trials. So this suggests that target enhancement happens earlier when there's low noise. And the distractor suppression also happens earlier in the low noise condition. And in addition to that, we also see that there's attentional capture going on by the additional singleton, but only in the high noise condition, not in the low noise condition. So this distractor into PC is only in the high noise condition, not here. Yeah, so this tells us something about the priority map, map based on which we um, deploy our attention. So first, oops. So first we um, have more attention deployment towards the target. And then we also, you can't see this in this display, we would also have um, less um, suppression or later suppression in the heterogeneous context. So um, just by using a different background, different noise levels, we can see um, different performance. And this performance is due to several things. More attentional capture when there's high noise, later suppression when there's high noise, and also later target enhancement when there's high noise. This brings us to the second question. So this is about learning experience. Now imagine, um, you're not from, um, maybe some of you are from, from, uh, from Bavaria, and you can see these um, beer logos. So they all have the same priority because for Bavarians, they're just, you know, like random letters. But if you're someone who's uh, maybe lived in Dortmund for a longer period of time, then you would see that this one has a high priority uh, because you've been drinking that beer maybe a couple of times. So just um, through learning experience, the priority can change dramatically, of course, even though the salience might be the same, or even though the top-down priority might also be the same. To give you another example, imagine you're roaming the jungle for food and you want to tell apart the edible cassis berries from the deadly nightshade. Now, what you could do is you could focus on color. But unfortunately, these two berries have a very similar color. So instead, what you could do is focus on shape because the leaves have different shapes and this allows us to tell them apart. Or you have some Lego bricks on the ground and you need to sort them according to color. So in this case, color is relevant and shape would be relevant. So in this study, we wanted to see how this learning experience actually affects visual attention. So we put people in two groups and they had a different learning experience with one feature dimension. So one group had to pay attention to shape and another group had to pay attention to color. And then in the second part, we looked at how much their attention was biased towards red. Please note that for both groups, red was irrelevant, but for one group, color was relevant, and for another group, shape was relevant. So these are from the same feature dimension. These are from different feature dimensions, namely, or, namely shape and color. The learning task was uh, 
looked something like this. So search stress was similar, but also had like these lines in here. So here participants had to report the line orientation, whereas here one group had to report color and the other group had to report shape. So basically um, they saw the same um, displays in the learning cast, but had to do different things with it. So the color group would say green here, blue, green, blue, whereas the um, shape group would say triangle, triangle, pentagon, pentagon in these cases. So the question was if uh, one group had a constantly high priority of color and a constantly low priority of shape, how would that affect attention deployment in the second task, the visual search task? Now the visual search task was really exactly the same for both groups, um, instructions and um, as well the, the actual uh, physical appearance of this on the screen. And there were distractor present and distractor absent trials. In the distractor present trials, there would be this red additional singleton. And again, we measured the distractor into PC, the PD, and the target into PC. Let's start with the behavioral results. So you can see that there was some singleton cost, distractor cost. So when this item was present, there were longer response times, just like many studies have shown before. But this difference between absent and present was more pronounced for the color group than for the shape group. So this already tells us that there was some effect of the learning experience on the, on the behavioral performance. And of course, we wanted to see again how this affected the EEG or how the EEG might explain the behavioral results. So let's have a look at the color group. What you can see here is that they had um, target into PC, so they did attend the target. That's not surprising um, because they were reasonably well um, doing the task reasonably well. Um, but if we compare this to the shape group, the shape group had a larger target into PC. So for them, it was easier to attend to the target compared to the color group. At the same time, the color group had a relatively large PD component. So they needed a lot of effort to suppress the additional singleton compared to the um, shape group. Here, the PD was smaller. And in addition, you can also see a distractor and to PC here. Can you see my uh, mouse pointer? Okay, great. Yeah, so you can see there's a, a small but significant distractor and to PC here. So what does this story tell us? Well, it tells us that if you've learned that color, namely blue and green, are relevant for a long period of time, then red does seem to gain in priority as well because it can capture your attention and it needs more suppression than if you had a different learning experience where shape, only shape was important. And the other, the, the flip side of the coin is that, that this seems to affect how many resources are available for the target processing. Because at the same time, while here the distractor is attended, the, dis, the target is less attended. While at the same time, um, here the target is attended more. Um, I can see that there's a frame around a name. I don't know if that means that they raised their hand, but um, if they did, um, they might, they, they, they should feel free to say something. No? Okay. Um, all right. So um, again, this tells us um, that it's quite a differential picture. It's not just if performance is better or worse we can see why the performance is affected by the learning experience, which sub-processes of attention are, um, are resulting um, in these differential performance patterns that we see. And if you think about this as priority maps, and you can see that the shape group might have um, less enhancement than the color group, um, or the, may, might in initially have a different, this is supposed to be animated, yeah. So you can see that there's different um, suppression of the additional singleton. 
So the shape group uh, requires less suppression than the color group. And um, this might also affect subsequent processes, for example, related to working memory. Another factor that can um, affect how attentional resources are deployed is reward. So typically, um, reward can capture our attention um, because it is relevant to us. It can bring us some advantage um, compared to other people if we detect reward-related items quickly. And this has been shown in, in many um, animal and uh, human studies that, um, that there is some, uh, some attentional advantage com um, if you compare um, high value and low value items, for example. But it is important to know that um, the most rewarding item is not necessarily the item you should attend the most. Because in certain situations, there, this might also be detrimental. So there's always this trade-off between these factors and other factors. Look at this example. If you're distracted um, by this 50 euro bill, you might actually lose your main task, which is, more, which is presumably more important at that time. So at some, there's many situations where reward-related items and top-down attention, your current goals, are at contradiction. So how can we measure that? Again, the assumption would be that we have some activation for, for example, for a target and something for um, a reward-related item, and we want to compare this with a visual search task. So in this task, again, this was a lot of items, as you can see here. So we have like a rich background. And uh, the search task here was, again, to find this line. In this case, not to detect it, but to report the orientation. So was it like this or was it like this? And we had two distractor types this time, blue and red. And for half the people, red was associated with high reward and blue with low. And for the other group, it was vice versa. So in this example, red would be high reward and blue would be low reward. So please note that there's no incentive for participants to attend this item because it's completely task irrelevant. It's really just a distractor. Um, the best performance you would achieve by only attending the target um, and, to, and by ignoring the color distractor. Here are the behavior results of this, um, of this example. Um, so what you can see is that high reward results in worse performance. This means that it is uh, potentially like this. If you have like uh, this, this red high reward item at the same time as the target, then it takes longer to respond to the target compared to a target that is um, presented at the same time as a low reward distractor. And you can also see how this learning effect evolves over time. So in the, in the beginning, you don't really see uh, this difference, but then it evolves over time when participants learn this, um, this uh, relationship between color and reward. Again, we want to have a look at the EEG to, to better understand the behavioral pattern. Um, now, these are the target lateral trials, again, to these uh, which um, show us the target N2PC, how much attention is deployed to the relevant item. And as you can see, for low reward, there is a higher target N2PC amplitude compared to high reward. Blue is higher than red. Again, in line with the behavioral results, showing that the target can receives more attention when it competes with a low reward distractor. If we look at the distractor lateral trials, we can see that for a high reward distractor, there's more attentional capture. The amplitude is higher. Here, red is higher than blue. And we can also see that there is a larger PD for high reward. So what this tells us is basically that a high reward distractor is first capturing more attention 
and then there's more suppression required to overcome that attentional capture compared to low reward spec. And again, this is likely related to fewer resources left over for the target to be processed. So first you have a higher target activity for the low reward to the target and less distract activity compared to the high reward. And then later you have need more suppression at that location. So what we've seen so far is um, these models described that we have goals and attention is one factor, physical salience is another factor, and they both determine how items are represented on the priority map. Then there was this addition to visual attention that, uh, to visual attention theories that the um, selection history or learning experience, so something that's potentially unrelated to physical salience and the current goals can also affect um, the priority map. And then later, the suppression aspect came um, on top of that. So here, suppression can also be affected by goals and intention. If I know that something needs to be suppressed, this can affect the priority map. Where if I've constantly suppressed uh, color, then it might also be easier for me to suppress color in subsequent trials. This is again, this um, basic principle, like uh, looking at the amplitude as a of these uh, components as a measure of the attentional subcomponents. And with ERPs, these, at least these three factors can be measured and compared between conditions. But there's also limitations because the visual displays require certain, um, well, there's certain limitations here because um, you can only uh, measure one item's priority per trial. So remember that we could only, for example, uh, measure the um, distractor activity if the target is presented on the vertical midline. So we can't use that trial for target processing analyses. Um, then the priority can only be measured with all odd elements on the vertical midline. So this is again, uh, by odd element, I mean something that is popping up like a target or distractor. So one of them has to be on the vertical midline, which uh, makes it sometimes difficult to uh, counterbalance all conditions. At least it's an additional restriction. And the priority can only be measured as a response to a signal. So we're looking at evoked potentials here. So something appears on the screen and then as a response to that stimulus, we can see um, the ERP and then the ERP can be um, different components within that ERP can be used as a neural marker. Um, but we cannot use that, for example, for anticipatory activation or for more sustained tracking of the attention. Um, there's some components that have a more sustained pattern, for example, the CDA component and working memory. But for attention, for example, this is more difficult than even the CDA. It's, not, it's, it's um, at, at some point going down after two seconds or so. So um, how can we overcome these limitations of ERPs? Well, what we can also do is use machine learning algorithms um, and um, apply them to EEG signals. Um, and just to compare how this might look, if you're Batman looking for um, the right Lego brick here, then ERPs allow you to tell apart um, two possibilities in this case, attentional capture, like more attention here, compared to no attention or less attention on the other side. So this is really um, a very coarse priority map based on the M2PC component. We can really only compare the left and right hemisphere in a given trial. And with, e, uh, with in, inverted encoding models, that's a machine learning approach I will explain in the following, the last part of this presentation. Um, we can actually measure attention deployment at different locations simultaneously. 
So again, the ERP, we have a stimulus, then we have the ERP as a response to that, and any deflection in the ERP tells us what's going on at that particular moment in time. With IEMs, inverted encoding models, we can uh, track over time, and we can even look at the signal prior to a stimulus onset. So what is an inverted encoding model? Again, um, it's a machine learning approach. It's basically an algorithm um, trained to code, so to represent certain locations in space. And the model's assumption is that the EEG measured at each electrode on the scalp reflects the weighted sum of some kind of spatial channel in the brain that is tuned for a certain um, location, for a certain angular location. So to illustrate this, Imagine you have this location number four here, then the model assumes that somewhere in the brain, there's a neural ensemble that is perfectly representing attention deployment at position four. Now this channel, uh, it's, it's important to know that when I say channel, I I'm not speaking about the electrodes. So electrodes are the physical things on your, on your head when you measure participants. Channels are the uh, theoretically assumed um, neural ensembles in your, in your brain. So this channel fires a lot when there's something attended at position four, but even at position five and three, it does um, show some activity, even if it's less, and then it gradually declines to more lateral positions. And then you also assume that a similar um, but slightly different channel exists for position five, showing the same pattern, but being optimally tuned to position five and so on. So what we do during the model training is um, we want to find the weights for these uh, channels. So how does each channel contribute? Um, sorry, how does each um, electrode contribute to a given channel? So for example, this electrode might be the summed weight from these channels here. So you can see that the line thickness varies. This is supposed to represent the weight. And then you can see this electrode here might have a different weighted sum of the channels and so on. So this is um, computationally determined. And then once we have these activities, these weights, we can invert the model and now look at independent data on the electrode level and, and calculate back whether we do see some channel activity. And this is, of course, always, um, there's always some noise, of course, so this doesn't look as perfect as, as the model initially, but it could, for example, look like this. So what does this mean? Um, for example, if um, something is presented on position four, then you would, we would actually see the highest activation for this channel, this teal channel. But the channel that is optimally tuned to position five would also show relatively high activity. And the other channels would show a little less activity here. So if our model would be un, if, if our model was unable to encode the attention, the location which is attended, then this should be entirely flat, but it's not flat. And you can see that if you shift them to a common um, center like this, and then do the average that you have a nicely tuned uh, channel response here. So this is called the channel tuning function. And this is for one point in time. And you can do this for all points in time that you're interested in. And because the model is trained on representing attention deployment at a given location, uh, but it doesn't require any um, new stimulus, you can even look at the channel activity prior to the stimulus onset, which in this case is pretty flat because there's no attention deployment going on. But in principle, for example, in queuing tasks or in kind of any kind of task where, you, where people might attend different locations for
prior to stimulus onset, you could also measure that. So um, this is, for example, this, so this would be the slice that we see here, for example, for this time point. But as you can see, this, this is um, across time. And then the, um, um, how much the channels um, are tuned to a given location is coded in color. So the more orange or yellowish it is here, the better, um, the more attended that location was. So this is the same data, um, just a bird's eye view. And as you can see, so this is from, a, from, um, from an experiment by Foster and colleagues. You can see that they used a, um, they used a queuing task. And when participants were, for example, queued here, then the location minus one would not show as much activity as the location zero. And the further you go away from the queued location, the less tuning, um, the less specific tuning you see. So we wanted to use that to see if we can also track um, suppression. And um, to do that, basically what we did is we trained the model on target position in distractor absent trials. So here in these trials, you can only see the diamond shaped target Again, the task was to report the orientation of the line within, but there's like no unique color element. There's no additional color singleton. And if it was presented, let, we call this position one. Um, we could use these trials. And then for example, for position two, we use these trials. And then for position, for all other positions, we had six positions here. We could track um, how the different topographies look like. So really the idea would be to tell the model, okay, this is how the scalp topographies look when there's a target presented on position one. This is how they look like it's on position two and this would be position six. And then we can determine the weights. And then in the additional singleton present trial, so when there's um, this additional red item here, we say, hey model, we have this scalp activity now. So this is independent trials. This is something the model hasn't seen before. Um, now use the weights we determined earlier for position one, because let's say we're first interested in the target position and then calculate the channel activity. We can use the exact same trial here, but this time, so it's the same trial as you can see because the scalp distribution is exactly the same. But this time we say, hey model, we have this scalp activity and now use the weights for position five and calculate the channel activity. Why five? Because this time we want to apply the model to the distractor um, position. So here we're trying to see how much attention is deployed at position one, because that's the target. And here we want to see how much um, attention is deployed to location five, because that's where the distractor is. And this is, these are the channel tuning functions we observed. Um, so I have to uh, highlight this is filtered activities. So alpha band activity, that's EEG filtered from eight to 13 Hertz. Um, and this as well, but this is for the distractor activity. So what you can see is um, that it's nicely tuned to the central position, which means it can well represent what is presented at the designated location. Um, and to get a better idea of the attention deployment itself, we can look at the slope. The slope is basically how, how steep it goes uphill. So how distinct the central position is compared to the surrounding positions. And this looks something like this. So what we can see here is that initially we have a high slope for distractor and target a bit higher for distractor, meaning there's more attention deployed to the colorful irrelevant item than to the actual target. And then later on, we can see that there's no attention deployed to the distractor anymore, only the target. So this tells us a lot about the um, temporal properties of um, attention deployment. 
um, the additional singleton does capture attention, but at the same time, we can already focus on the target um, at the same time to some extent. And then later in the more sustained areas, so like around 300 milliseconds and later, you can see that um, there's still sustained attention to the target, but there's no attention deployment to the distractor anymore. So this was alpha. I'm going to show you um, the last um, couple of slides here on theta band activity. So this is from four to eight hertz. And again, we look at the slope. You can already see that this is quite a different pattern here because there seems to be some kind of valley or dip. So rather than um, high activity in the center, we have low activity or below baseline activity here. And this is also what we can see here. So um, again, theta band activity tracks attention plumbing towards the target, just like alpha. But the distinct thing is really the below baseline activity and theta band activity for the distractor. And this means we can actually use this inverted encoding model, this machine learning approach to track suppression throughout the visual field. So instead of just comparing contra and ipsilateral activity like this, um, we can track different um, locations in the visual field at the same time. So at least eight items, probably more, can be tracked with this method. Um, the position is not important anymore, so you don't, you don't need to uh, carefully um, use uh, trials only where one item is on the vertical midline and the rest is lateral or vice versa. Um, the priority can be measured in anticipation of simulation and for a longer period of time. But um, you also need more trials and there's other careful considerations you need to uh, consider um, for the experimental design, for example, to make the um, model unbiased. So ideally, uh, what I would suggest is to use ERPs and IEMs in combination which allows you to better interpret the multivariate results because the, um, the ERPs are usually well-established markers of visual attention, and um, but the IEM gives you a higher resolution in space. Basically, you can get a better image of what the priority for each item in the visual field is at a given point in time. Last, I would like to thank my collaborators and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Very interesting, great talk and clear, clear explanations. Really cool. Um, yeah, so uh, I would think we should open up for questions. Um, most of you know already, uh, I like to uh, organize this by asking you to uh, just put your name in the chat if you have a question. Uh, and I already see some messages coming in. Um, Roseanne already posted a question earlier. Um, I, I could, of course, read it now, but maybe Roseanne wants to just ask it again herself. Uh, sure, yeah, it was not really a question, but more thought. Uh, thanks for the awesome talk, by the way. Um, so obviously this paradigm is often used where you have to look for the shape and ignore the color, but I was wondering if you inverted it, if you'd get kind of the opposite effect, because your task is now biasing uh, the subjects that have learned the shape uh, as opposed to the color contingency. And if you looked at that. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's an important question because um, in our example, the target was always less salient than the additional singleton in the visual search task. So shape is generally less salient than color as previous studies have shown. So that's why we started with this actually to get um, yeah, more of an attentional capture effect. Um, if you invert it, I think you could see the same pattern but it would probably be slightly weaker because if you are looking for a color target um, then the shape can be relatively well um, ignored in the first place. Um, but in principle, it should work. Um, it should work the same. And it will also be interesting to look at other dimensions, for example, um, size and orientation. Yeah. Thanks. And Fariba also has a question. Yes, sir. Uh... Yeah, my question is that in the motion learning, you're using the 
training from the uh, when you don't have the distractor in time and then uh, when you do the uh, when, when the distractor is present and you use the weights from the uh, when distractor is not present you assume that the timing of the target should be similar isn't it because the uh, timing of uh, attention to the target and uh, and then you try to find the distractor effect or attention. But is it really similar? I mean, maybe there is a delay in analyzing mm -hmm. the target. Yeah, can you maybe uh, elaborate a little bit what you mean by timing of the target? I'm not I, I mean, for example, imagine that uh, you get the, uh, this uh, peak, uh, the best peak for the position yeah. uh, at a specific time points then you don't have the distractor. But this peak is not necessarily happening for the target at that specific, at, at, the, at that point when the distractor is present. Yes, um, right. But the ways are coming from, from the uh, training without the distractors. Yes, but we train the model uh, for each time point. So um, we actually, so for example, if you, let's say you, you're interested in the activation at this line that yeah. is indicated by this magenta line here. Um, so this is completely independent of whatever happens here or here or any time point. This model is really trained and tested on the same time point here. So what we, what, the, the reason why we chose the target only trial, so without the additional singleton is um, that we just want to get an idea of um, how how would a child response look like when they're really attending the target location? Because in that trial, there would be no reason to assume they're attending any other location. When we test the model, we wanted to use this exact same uh, trials, um, but different different we do use different weights for the, because we're interested in either location one or five, depending on where the individual items are. But the important thing is that this is not biased because um, imagine you are interested in, in, for example, in this location, for example, here, then, or let's, oh, I need a location where you test it here. So for example, if you're interested in um, target activation at location one, so this means we have as many trials where the distract is presented at any of the other locations. So this is completely unbiased. There, this could be um, because the ring can be presented at any other location. So this should be completely unbiased. I don't know if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Yeah, so you mean that when you have the distractor present, you do all the training again, not using the training from the uh, target only no we used it we, we trained the model on the target only and we tested on the target and distractor mm -hmm. okay yes thank you it, you can also i mean the paper is out now so um for if, you, if you're interested in any details that might mm. be beyond the scope of this talk um feel free to look that up and send me an email okay. something it's unclear okay thank you Okay, then Daniel also has a question. Yes, uh, thanks for the uh, excellent talk. Um, so I would have a question um, regarding your earpiece in this experiment where you manipulated reward for uh, those stimuli. Yeah. Maybe switch back to those. Yeah. Uh, Maybe. Yeah, exactly those ones. So, so this is something I uh, um, I encountered a lot, uh, many times myself. So, um, when we have a look at NGPC and also at PD, um, when is something um, a PD, and when uh, is something not a PD? So, um, for the distracted lateral trials, we see this contralateral suppress and um, yeah contralateral uh, increase um, uh, uh, contralateral positivity sorry 
And um, for the target lateral twice, we actually also see a contralateral positivity following the N2PC. This one here. This one, yeah. And um, of course, there's no lateral distractor there. Um, but I always wonder is, uh, what I always wonder is, when there is a lateral distractor, we say it's PD. And when there is not, we say it's not a PD. And um, I, I wonder what you maybe think is, uh, yeah, this contralateral positivity, the target lateral trials might reflect. Um, yeah, that's, that's an important point. So um, as you, well, I don't know if you can see it, but um, they're pretty much aligned here. So there's, uh, we didn't find a significant difference here. So we didn't really focus on this at all. Um, also, at that time, it wasn't really discussed what happens after the N2PC. Um, but there is some interesting um, data now showing that it might be that after you tend something, you actually suppress it for a while to basically release attention. So basically, it's a mechanism to release attention from the target once you've extracted all the relevant features. Um, so in a way, I would say to answer your question, if it's positive, if it's a contralateral positivity, just like in this case here, this bit, or this, this means that this hemis uh, hemifield is suppressed. Um, but we don't call it PD if it's the target because, well, it's not the distractor that is suppressed. And it might, um, it might not mean the same thing, but it could, it's possible that, as I said, it's just a suppression that follow the suppression of the target that follows the, the, the attention deployment towards the target. So here, this is, um, I guess, um, this is some kind of reactive suppression. So your attention is captured and you need to overcome it. Here, this is probably voluntary attention deployment, but you still overcome it, maybe to you know, um, release the, um, the resources that were previously um, used to process the target. And that's why we see the differences in the, between the conditions here, um, because there's more attention deployment here towards the high reward distractor, there's more suppression required. Mm -hmm. there's, not, there's, there's, there's not so much of a difference, so this might mean something different, maybe it's just a general release of, of resources, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's still not entirely clear what this means. So mm -hmm. I think Steve Luck in one paper argued that you always need to release attention from, um, from anything you attended and that this um, positivity as a response to the N2PC is reflecting that, but unclear at this point. Would be very interesting to look at this in a designated experiment. Yeah, certainly. And also this, um, this very early uh, contralateral positivity in the distraction lateral trials. So yeah, the PD. Some like early PD effects, etc. Would you say that this might mean something like? Yeah, there's a debate whether this, uh, this is sometimes called uh, PPC or uh, early PD, depending on the lab. Um, I think I've called it both in different papers. <laughs> um, it's it's not entirely clear what this means. So some people, there's some evidence suggesting that it could be really some early initial suppression and others um, found that it's probably some kind of physical imbalance on the screen. Um, but at this point, it's, it's not clear. You can see there's no significant difference here, significant difference here, but um, other studies found that it could be uh, affected by some experimental manipulation that is not only due to physical differences. So maybe it's a mix of both, but unclear at this point. All right, thank you. Okay, then Malta also has two questions. Oh yeah, thanks. Thanks for a great talk. So I have, I have one question regarding the um, PD component. So I found the electrophysiological results pretty compelling. And I was asking myself, in theory, if the PD is related to distractor suppression, participants should perform better on those trials where they show a larger PD. Is this the case? That is the case, yes. Um, I, don't, I don't think I have the correlation for these studies I've presented, but I have, so I, I think there's, 
a couple of you also interested in working memory, right? So I'm gonna show you very quickly something about working memory where we used a change detection task and we basically correlated um, the PD component with performance and in that case uh, working memory capacity. Um, so this is this plot here. What you can see is, so this is across three experiments, hence different colors here. So what you can see is that those participants with high performance, so high working memory capacity, were also the ones with a high PD um, amplitude. So in this case, you could actually say, yes, um, the PD or the work memory capacity predicts how much suppression is applied. And we did find that in other studies as well. Um, sometimes both um, the distractor and 2 pc and the PD are correlated with performance. Okay, cool. I think this makes makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's that's also related to the second question I'm having. Are the N2PC and the PD related? So is it the case that a participant who is a good target enhancer is also a good distractor suppressor? Or are these really independent, uh, not only states, but also independent traits? Yeah. Um, but first of all, you have to be careful uh, not putting too much um, like not overinterpreting these uh, correlations because it could just be, you know, like imagine you have a participant that just has a better connection, like uh, like the like low impedances or something like that. That might affect the N2PC and the PD, for example, right? So I would only um, trust the correlation where, like for example, you find a strong correlation uh, for a specific um, yeah, um, condition, but not for another one, for example, something like this. So, or group. Um, that said, we did find in some experiments, we did find a correlation between N2PC and PD, and sometimes we don't. There's, I mean, there's usually some correlation, but it's not always significant. I should put it this way. Um, yes, but the connection between the distractor N2PC and the PD is much stronger. So this okay. is more closely related, at least anecdotically. Yeah, thank you. Okay, then Roseanne had another question. Yeah, um, I had, so I wanna preface this by saying I know nothing about alpha or theta band or what they are supposed yeah. to represent, but I'm wondering why or, or kind of what is the underlying hypothesis about why theta, theta band is tracking suppression, whereas you don't see that uh, when you just look at alpha? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. Um, so there is, um, there is some evidence showing that, um, that suppression is related to theta band activity in, in, in animal studies, but it's a real relatively weak link. And um, what it could mean also, and we can't exclude that possibility, is just that it does reflect the PD component because um, the, um, well, the latency of the PD would actually fit well within um, like a theta band activity around yeah, six hertz or something. So, um, so it could just be um, that it is reflecting the PD amplitude, um, but that wouldn't necessarily be a problem because the, the real virtue of the, of the IM approach here is that we can, let's say it's just a PD, it could be that it, we could still use it to uh, track suppression throughout the visual field rather than with this more awkward approach of having one item on the vertical midline and only one other item laterally. So, um, so, but then what do you expect on trials where your distractor is on the midline? So how I'm, I'm kind of missing the translational step. I understand it could be the PD, but you can only pick up on the PD if you have this lateralized, right? But now you have it across the visual field. Right. Normally, normally you would have the 
uh, you would have the PD only if the distractor is presented laterally and the target is on the vertical midline. Um, but of course, the assumption is that the PD is um, a manifestation of some neural activity that would in principle also be active if it is presented on the vertical midline. It just becomes invisible to the lateralized ERP approach because it's affecting both hemispheres the same way. But um, the, the, the underlying channel, the neural ensemble that is potentially reflecting this activity should also be um, active if it's presented on the vertical midline and the IEM can then use that signal as well. Um, the IEM is basically doesn't require the lateralization. Um, maybe to, to briefly follow up on this, since we're already talking about the theta alpha results. So that was, uh, if I didn't miss something, that was still in response to the visual search array, right? That was, that was not anticipatory, right? Um, yes, this was not anticipatory, no. So have, have you already, like, looked at data where you try to like cue participants and whether the, so as far as I know for alpha I think no one has been able to really show that there is also sort of anticipatory like real active suppression mm -hmm. so how, have you checked for a theta whether in like a cueing paradigm um, that translate to like an anticipatory yeah. mechanism no, that's, that's, um, we haven't done that yet, but this would definitely be one of the next steps to see, because as you said, alpha has already been used to track um, anticipatory suppression. So if, for example, I think there was a, a paper from the Tewis lab where um, they had participants learn that um, distractors would be more likely presented on one of eight locations or something. And then after a while, you can see that there is some kind of anticipatory alpha suppression going on contralateral to that location, suggesting that, sorry, um, there's an alpha increase, of course, because you're suppressing it. So alpha increase means more suppression. Uh, alpha suppression means more enhancements. It's a little confusing, but so that's what they found. And um, you would expect that if, if you use um, if you use our approach um, with the IEM, you should also see that. Um, we couldn't do that in our data because um, there was no distinct location that would make sense for participants to suppress in an anticipatory way. Um, but that would be really interesting to see. We did use alpha band activity in an inverted encoding model um, to look at anticipatory activation, namely in a, um, in a queuing task where um, we varied basically the, the width of the um, attentional spotlight. So it's basically a zoom, basically to show the zoom lens effect. So the zoom lens describes if you have a broader attentional focus, um, you can detect the wider away, further away items better, but at the cost of, of um, well, attentional and how, of how much you can attentionally enhance them. And we could track that well with the um, alpha band activity and an inverted encoding model. There was um, a paper uh, I published with um, Ed O last year. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, then I think we have one more question by Lewis. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I wonder if it's okay to try to situate your work in the uh, dark ages of um, folk psychological terms, bringing it back to Posner queuing, and only because there's a lot of overlap in terms of the kind of words that you're using, right? So um, Posner cues have always, by the division of exogenous and endogenous mechanisms, been then rearranged along the temporal dimension where it goes like exogenous is fast, endogenous is slow, and you're borrowing a lot of similar terminology in a sense, but not, but you might at the very same time be talking about all your results purely in terms of only 
exogenous. So I, I'm not really quite sure how to situate your findings, right? Um, because like aspects like the uh, involvement of reward, Poston would assign that to only endogenous or slower processes. So, uh, so this is a very broad question, but I'm just thinking of how I could best situate your findings in terms of psychological or more familiar psychological folk mechanisms, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, no, of course. Um, I mean, um, yeah. So the visual search task was um, popularized by Anne Treisman. And um, she was, yeah, using it basically to, to, to put forward her very influential feature integration theory, uh, which is still the basis for all modern attentional theories. Um, Posner um, really had a different approach to measuring attention, for example, using these well, cues like exogenous and endogenous cues. So for example, an endogenous cue would be a central arrow pointing to a certain direction, and then you can um, well, anticipate, or you can already um, deploy attention to that location to better process the upcoming item at that location. Um, so, and th so the difference between exogenous and endogenous is usually not applied in visual search tasks, but you could do that. Namely, you could say, well, attention deployment towards the target is endogenous because um, it's not particularly salient and you need to voluntarily deploy it to that location. Whereas the um, additional singleton is very salient, just like an exogenous queue in the Posner world. So um, that would be more automatic. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I, can't, I don't know if you really see that kind of pattern that Posner would have predicted here, but you do see that there's, um, so endogenous attention is generally considered more sustained. And you do see that here, right? So attention deployment to the target is more sustained. Um, and at least initially, even though there's already attention deployment towards the target, you do see there's more attention to the, to the, to the distractor. So this could be due to the exogenous component being stronger initially. Um, but Posner, I guess, would have predicted that this is actually happening faster earlier. So um, I guess in, 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 to some extent, it's in line with um, these queuing para with this queuing paradigm. And to some extent, it's not. But you have to keep in mind it's really a totally different experiment. So yeah, this might explain the different pattern here. Does that make sense? Yes. I, I mean, I was basically leading this up also partly because of your findings with regards to the PD component. And that was alluded to as well by uh, Ms. Rademacher and also in your answer to, to Daniel Schneider uh, in terms of what does that really represent, right? Um, so it's definitely related to the spatial presentation, uh, to the spatial properties of a salient distractor, right? Uh, but it's because you're also relating these to top-down processes. So that I think that's why I, I, I just wanted to know some kind of, just wanted to know if there could be some kind of situation within this temporal organization. Uh, what do you mean by situation? You know, how it would be situated in terms of the temporal organization of the onset of, 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 um, of, 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 mechanisms um well i invite you to check out our other paper the one with um at o um, where we look at the zoom lens because there we use um we use um exogenous cues mm -hmm. to well to make participants attend certain parts of the visual field and mm -hmm. then maybe maybe that will illustrate better how how it can be used in a, in a posner kind of paradigm. But uh, in short, what we see there is indeed a later onset. Um, mm -hmm. Because, yeah, so, so it does take some time to um, divert it. Oh, well, I should say, the attention deployment to the peripheral location is relatively fast, but the differential allocation to wider and more narrow parts of the visual field that takes time. Mm -hmm. So that's with the endogenous component there. Okay. Right, thank you. 
Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think there are no more questions in the chat. So um, yeah, thank you Tobias again for presenting today. Um, that was a, a very cool talk. I think we all learned a lot. Um, yeah, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. And uh, yeah, as always, if there are our IGSN students in the audience, please stay with me in the Zoom room so uh, I can note down your names in case you want a uh, certificate of attendance. And to the rest of you, uh, yeah, have a good evening and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks again for inviting me. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.